Welcome to the Mike on Much podcast. I'm your host, Mike Veerman. We are here with our friend and trusty producer, Max Kerman. We also have our pop culture aficionado, Shane Cunningham. And back from the cottage is Erica working the dials. Um, guys, we got a big show today. Uh, we have guests on this episode. We have Tyler Johnson and Evan Stern from Letterkenny, uh, which is premiering December 25th, Christmas Day on Crave. We will get to those fellas in a bit. We had a great conversation. Max and I Zoomed with those guys. Um, but before we get to that, how's everyone doing? Erica, how long are you up at the cottage for a weekend or are you up there still? What's going on with your background there? No. Um, oh, I'm, um, I'm not in my regular home. I'm at my friend's house right now. Um, but yeah, I, I went to the cottage for the weekend. It was so nice. Friend's it was house. A great getaway. Yeah. <laughs> Is this person in your bubble? Uh, yeah, yeah. He's in my bubble and my family. He? Bubble, so. oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, no um, other questions. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, but yeah, it was great. We went to Bayfield for the weekend, and then we were in Toronto for just one night last night. And um, it you was and just the friend. A nice... <laughs> yes, me and okay. the friend. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it was a nice. You saw day. Ash and I walking, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. Did you hear me honk? I did not hear the honk, but we got your text message. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I saw you guys walking down Dundas. I was like, ah, familiar faces. It's it's Toronto's so weird now driving around there, and it's such a I ghost know. town, especially on like a. We were there for on a Saturday night, and it was just kind of spooky almost, you know, especially in the West End there. It's weird. I stayed at um, the Nuts condo just because it feels like a hotel to me. And yeah. I stayed there on Friday night just by myself. It was kind of awesome. And he's right at Queen and ba- uh, King and Bathurst. And it's just so weird. Like Friday night, I popped out to get like some stuff at the convenience store. And it was like 1130 on a Friday night, which typically is like, you know, the busiest time for that intersection. Yeah. And it was empty. It's just like, this is just so, so bizarre. I remember in the early days, speaking of like the old drive-by and you see somebody you know, uh, the early days of the pandemic, uh, when I was sort of overlapping with the, 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 the apartment, like the condo and then the house in Hamilton, I had to come back into, uh, Toronto to do some stuff. And as I was driving by like the old place, I saw Max and Ash come out of a Starbucks. (laughs) And I was like kind of going gliding through an intersection, but I was so excited to see my friends in person that I like immediately like hammered the window down. And I was like, yo, it's Max from Markel's like trying to do a bit. But I was also, I was focusing on that. Then I was like not focusing on the road. And I'm like, you idiot, just like drive. You see them on Zoom. You talk on the phone all the time. But I got so excited. Uh, and I don't I don't even know if you guys totally knew it was me until I texted after. And I was like, that was me. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, but I that understand. Reminds, I, that happened to me before, but I was. Remember that street that that road that led up to um, the Ancaster Theater? Yes, and you had to walk down. So I was walking that because I, I didn't drive till I was like twenty five. But Steve Zarkani's coming up that street, and he he rolls down his window and goes, "Hey Shane," and and does like a like an over exaggerated wave. <laughs> but then he rammed another car from oh, behind, no. <laughs> and I had. To- I had to wait there as the witness to the accident for an extra hour and missed my movie. It was terrible. Very uh, funny, though. That is, that is very it was funny. right out of a movie, though. It's exactly how you'd picture it. I think even the um, the airbag went off. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wow. So for the advice um, for... Uh, the advice for listeners is maybe just hit, hit the horn a couple times or just keep it moving. No need to roll down the window and yell and something. And don't commit to the bit. No. You know, just yell out, but keep the eyes on the road. Absolutely. But yeah, speaking of friends, I was on a Heist podcast. Hey. Recently I recorded. I, I did something. You know, usually I'm not doing well, anything. What was the episode about? What yeah, we're, yeah, yeah. So, so for the history for our listeners, we we love Heist Podcast. Uh, our good good friend of the pod, he's been on here many times, is Matt Unsworth. Uh, also, Simon is co-host. Uh, they're great. Shane, you've been on there as a call-in guest before, but you've never had like the, the sit down because when I was in LA, I went over to their studio. Max was in LA. I think he sat down and did a heist thing in the studio. You, have, you hadn't been called to the third chair yet and this was a point of contention. Uh, oh, I fucked it all up too. Yeah. What? <laughs> well, because I used to listen to heist all the time because I was commuting, but it's been however long we've been in quarantine, what, 10 months since I've listened to a podcast for anything other than to go to sleep. So I forgot that the guest is kind of just like a color commentator. They're not supposed to chime in with facts about the case. But I, <laughs> so I did so not knowing that, I did so much fucking research on this case. I rented the movie. So I start watching the movie. And the movie's wrong in some instances, it's right in some instances, like like a lot of these movies based on true stories are. <laughs> and then I'm reading all these articles. So we start the pod and and Matt Unsworth and Simon, they, they're supposed to lead and I'm supposed to chime in. 
but they were getting some stuff mildly wrong. So I kept interjecting and being like, actually, <laughs> no, 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 and saying this. And and then Unz was like, no, 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 uh, th- this part's actually right. And we, we, you know when you don't, you're being polite, but he was kind of, I could tell I was pissing them off a little bit. And then I had one fact that was completely wrong and I had to do like editor's notes and it didn't work out the way I think they were hoping it <laughs> to work out. <laughs> like, I think they thought I was going to be really funny, but instead I was just like the annoying nerd. <laughs> I think that there is a, there, there's a piece in that book, How to Make Friends and Influence People. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think I'm remembering this correctly, where they basically say, if you're at a dinner party, if you're a guest at a dinner party and say like the host gets up and he's making a speech and he says something blatantly wrong, it serves you no uh, purpose to ever correct the host. It's like, you just mm-hmm. actually have to be, and that's, you know, how to make friends and influence people. It's like, just be quiet, just eat it. Cause what are you going to gain out of it? Like you might, like it might uh, serve your self-satisfaction that you're right, or it yeah. might bother you so much that they're giving misinformation. But ultimately at the party of the host, you, you just kind of got to let it, let them keep talking. Yeah. But on a podcast, like Unsworth <laughs> is already my friend. So I'm not trying to win him over as a friend, but the listeners, I'm trying to provide proper context but yeah so on a podcast that rule of thumb might be a little bit different but it didn't work out in in any sense because i didn't know that i was supposed to just be cracking jokes and that was my fatal flaw man (laughs) what do you know what the heist is what like what let's promo it a bit yeah there's a movie called american animals it's actually based on the house uh the heist it's an amazing uh movie it's by the guy that did who directed the imposter do you remember that it's like a documentary but it's awesome. And this movie got buried. It has like 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's it's very, very cool. Oh. And it's based off... Um, so you recommend some, it? I've been looking for something to watch. Oh, I recommend the movie Hardcore. And uh, the, the heist is about uh, some college kids who steal books from a library. Very expensive books worth upwards of $12 million. It's an amazing wow. story. Like, What's it called? It's called American Animals. The okay, movie. Cool. But Don't the heist is cool. It was one of the coolest heists, and they've been trying to do this uh, this one for a while. They wanted it to be special, and then I felt like they were very disappointed in me. Max, it's a good episode, and they're so pro. Like they do all this research. They have this this sheet up that I was supposed to have on the screen. I didn't know I was supposed to have it too. <laughs> well, yeah, you had it all in your head. Like they man. do a rundown that you're supposed to have kind of in front of you and have read beforehand to follow the the basic points of the story but i was just like annoyingly interjecting myself and correcting the points that i didn't have on my screen i'm sure you're still you're still great on it i'll listen to it um max did you have something you were going to say about what you've been up to or are we segueing into a topic mm. here you, you look like you had well, something you had a sparkle in your eye I'm like, oh well i, I said i want to mention um because i couldn't really tweet this humble brag but i, I thought i could talk <laughs> about it on on the podcast, you know, there's like a difference if you tweet something versus just mention something on a podcast. But um, I missed a FaceTime call from Nick Nurse the other day, and totally normal I, sentence, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I'm I texted him back in the morning. I'm like, hey, so I missed your FaceTime call. What's up? He's like, you free now? You free in ten minutes? I'm like, yeah. He's like, calling you. I'm like, okay, what's this going to be about? And um, he called me from his new hotel room in Tampa, where the band, so not the band, where the team is headquartered right now. And they wanted to make it feel like home, the Raptors like organization. So they put up uh, blown up photos in his hotel room of his favorite things. So he has prints uh, blown up, big big picture of prints, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Uh, Thelonious Monk, his his favorite musician, and Nick Nurse on stage with Arkells at Budweiser <laughs> stage. It's about probably three foot high, two feet across, uh, and it's right next to his bed. And then he pres- and so I was very flattered that I'm going to be kind of sleeping next to Nick in Tampa, <laughs> you know, every night. And um, and then he took me on a tour of the Raptors uh, facility, and basically he leaves his hotel room and he's in Raptors HQ. And uh, he walks right into uh, the dressing room where the guys are all hanging out. He says hi to Chris Bouchard. And then he's on the practice court. Uh, And they basically uh, kind of retrofitted a ballroom. Like, you know, if you can imagine a big convention center ballroom. And they put hardwood floor on and the basketball hoops up. And that's where he'll be living. So I just thought that was a really cool insight. I called Mike immediately right after to tell him all this this information. Yeah. 
Um, I'm like, give me all of Well, you said it's all on one floor. They took the, the whole floor of the hotel and it's all the rooms, their their gym, their court, their food. Like basically they just own that floor. So when Nick leaves his room, he's just down the hall as like a practice court. And he loves it. He sounds like it's like right up his alley. Anyway, so that's my little humble brag for the weekend, uh, which which I felt felt pretty cool about. What would you say? You, did you say that you and uh, Nick are talking like once a week FaceTime now? Yeah, I'd say that we, you know, we text pretty regularly. I don't know if we FaceTime regularly, but uh, yeah, no, we keep each other in the loop he, and w- what songs he's been working on. He, he brought his uh, guitar and piano to Charlotte. So he was just hanging on the hotel room uh, uh, on his day off and just playing songs. So yeah, no, no, we're, we're in touch. So in the Champagne Boys like group, there's probably about like, I don't know, 20 guys in there. Would you say that you are closer now to Nick than maybe like the back half of the <laughs> Champagne Boys group? <laughs> No, 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 no. Uh, th- 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 those are relationships I've had for over a decade. I don't know if Nick's quite in that category yet. And we were talking on the pod last week. Who was it we said? Uh, oh, Justin Bieber and his pastor. He looked up to him like a dad. And I was thinking, <laughs> oh, how that might be offensive. For you and Nick, is it like same level friends or do you look at him in a fatherly sense? Mm, I think he looks at me in a fatherly sense. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, but yeah, he did say, speaking of that, um, he did say that, because I asked him if he watched the episode of Open Gym. And he said, no, I usually, I you know, I'm living it and I don't usually watch it. But he's like, but I watch all your stuff, man. And I'm like, did you see the new P- Pub Crawl video? He's like, of course, I ordered the hoodie already. Hey! <laughs> hey Heavenly Father, can I call you daddy? <laughs> he put that in there. Um, I was like, which is very funny to think. Speaking of, thank you, Max and Ash and the whole Arkell's camp. Very classy. Uh, you guys sent us all Arkell's hoodies. All the Champagne Boys got uh, the pub crawl hoodie, which is exciting. Well, in lieu of being co-writers on the song, we figured we'd uh, satisfy you guys by just giving you a piece of merch. It's a really comfy hoodie, too. It's it is a good hoodie. Yeah, it's a very good hoodie. And by accepting uh, the hoodie and putting it on, we now forfeit any sort of like splits on percentages or co-writing exactly. or being named in the song. <laughs> right, yeah, okay. Good to know. Exactly. Good to know. Um, and how has the reception on the video been? People love the video. Some people think yeah. it's the our best video we've ever made. And, uh, you know, we made it to try to bring some smiles to people over this sort of depressing year. And uh, it seems to be working. So, yeah, people love it. Mark fucking killed it. So he yeah. showed it to Mark. I yeah. suffer from recency bias, but I, I do think it is your best video. Yeah. Thank and you. that's a video, too. Like when I talk about there's things that only you can pull off. I was just trying to imagine any of our other friends. be Like I was trying to imagine Mike walking down the street. <laughs> Wearing that coat, singing, doing that. It would just be <laughs> ridiculous somehow. But you doing it, you pull it off so well, Max. Like it, it, it's that perfect mix of like goofy and sincere. I don't know how you do it. Ah, you're making me smile. Man. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, it's a feel good episode, guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's segue to some topics, I suppose. Oh, do we have topics? Oh, we have Max, last minute. You can't slip in a topic at 11.55 when we're recording at noon. Am I supposed to know about this? This is funny. Well, I can pretty, set it up. This is this, well. So for our set listeners, it up, set it up. I, I chose it because I thought you'd be able just to riff on it without having. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, any, I'll riff then. Yeah, I'm good at yeah. riffing, as the people from Heist know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you actually with less information, you're better because you won't <laughs> yeah, be interrupting. Um, yeah, you'll be able to riff on this for sure. But essentially, okay. I'm sure you have heard about the first part of this story, and that is that uh, Warner Brothers announced uh, in early December that they had a whole bunch of movies planned for uh, the year that got delayed, and then obviously into. Um, 2021 20, uh, movies like Dune, which was going to be a huge movie. Obviously, the famous one is Wonder Woman, um, 1984, uh, and just a whole bunch of movies that people are aware of. Matrix Four. There's like a sequel, so like these major tentpole films that are made to be shown in theaters. That's how they make their money back. It's how you justify the budgets, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Warner Brothers sort of shocked everybody by just sort of saying. All of those movies, when they get released in theaters on the same day, will also get released on HBO Max, which is a streaming service, obviously, in the States. They're connected to Crave here uh, in Canada, uh, but we do not have HBO Max in Canada. This will come into play in a little bit uh, for the story. So this is a huge, huge moment because obviously, if you're sitting at home, especially during a pandemic, why would you go to a theater when you can just, you know, everyone has great TVs or a lot of people have great TVs these days. So people are most likely going to just stream Wonder Woman on Christmas Day as opposed to maybe going out and sitting in a theater. Now, this is obviously like for the people that make these films, whether it's the directors or the actors or the the theaters themselves, this is like, it's going to be, it's jarring, right? Because you go, oh my goodness, like 
what happened to the theater experience, what happened to, you know, we, we made this for the big screen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of sort of interested parties that have found this, this, this thing jarring. The consumer, I bet you, is celebrating. How many people are super excited to be getting this on a streaming service? Um, so that's first part of the story. That was like a big, big sort of news thing. The theaters were like, what the hell? Uh, some of the creators, like I said, were like, what the hell? Then the Directors Guild of America got involved uh, and they just sent a letter basically saying, Nobody negotiated this with us. This affects some directors have like percentage splits. They, you know, there's certain agreements in place. Now, if these films don't go into theaters, they're not going to get those back end revenue splits because they're just going to streaming service. Uh, and they're also saying, listen, Warner, we know why Warner Brothers is doing this. It's because they want people to sign up for HBO Max. It's a boost to promote like another sort of like, um, product that they have, which is the streaming service. But our industry is built on these theaters. That's what the whole industry has been built on for the last 60 years. And we're now messing with this. Obviously, it's unprecedented time. But they're basically trying to, I guess the union's trying to block it somehow or negotiate sort of different splits, but there's no way they're going to recruit the sort of revenue they would have made on just releasing Wonder Woman in theaters. But we're in a pandemic. Everybody's squeezed. Everybody's in tough times. Uh, This ultimately benefits the consumer. But I think for everybody else in that industry, it is, uh, it's a bit of a mess. Um, This also affects Canada because unlike the States, we will not be getting as of now, these movies on the same day they're released in theaters. So, you know, on Christmas day, when everybody in the States is getting Wonder Woman to stream on HBO Max, we would not be getting it right now on Crave. We'll be getting it when we normally would have got it on Crave when it would have been done its theater run. So that's its own sort of Canadian angle on this. But yeah, like, what do you guys think? Do you guys think that people, do you think that the creatives are right to sort of be outraged or do you think they just should be like, hey, these are unprecedented times? Again, they're also concerned that this will set a precedent going forward and maybe movies and theaters are sort of done. And we talked about this a long time ago. Um, who wants to talk first? Max, you put it in the group and Shane is still digesting since I just hit him with the story. Mm-hmm. No, uh, Unsworth actually went over this with me too, but continue. Oh, okay, good. Well, I was just going to say it's, it's an interesting year um, and it feels like it might be the year might be expediting things um, and going in a direction that it was headed. You know what I mean? So I think a lot of people um, said, you know, and by the way, I love going to the movie theaters, but a lot of people go, I don't really like, why would I pay for to go to, to go to the movie theater? I had everything I'm, that I ever wanted on my television. I got a big television at home. I don't need to go to the theaters and spend 18 bucks on a movie ticket. So it feels like on a certain level, it, it, it was going to happen regardless of uh, at some point. Um, as, as it stands, as it relates to the current deals that these directors have when it comes to like revenue splits, like I didn't actually even think about that, that part of the equation and how they might be, you know, losing out on that income. But that, that seems to happen every time technology shifts the paradigm, there are just new rules that are starting to make up. So when you think about like record deals and we were talking about this, or I was reading about this, I forget the other day about how, um, you know, we signed a record deal back in 2008 and we gave the, you know, the label the opportunity to exploit the music as much as they wanted all over around the world. We, we didn't know that Spotify was coming six years later, right? And that language was not even in the deal. So it's, it's a different example, but I think it's relevant in that it's like these directors who were probably accustomed to a certain way uh, that contracts would look, you know, it's just shifting and, and, it's, and it's a hard shift. And obviously it's not in the paperwork at the moment, but I do think it is, I think, unfortunately, a sign of things to come. And I say unfortunately because I do love going to the movies, uh, the movie theaters. Um, but Shane, yeah. uh, what did you talk about with uh, Unsworth? Oh, he was just telling me how everybody was really pissed. But he he gave kind of me the, the Mike Veerman preamble. But, uh, yeah, I just think superhero movies are so lame. And it's <laughs> a hot take. <laughs> like Wonder, Wonder Woman I found terrible. And I know a lot of people liked it, but... It was still cool because we were in the theater. It was awesome to see on the big screen. And it was an exciting event. I went there. Uh, our boss, Randall, took us there. Like it, was, it was like a work perk. And although I thought the story was lame and the movie itself wasn't, wasn't good, I had a really fun time. And that's, that's the wonderful thing about the theater. So for that, I'm kind of sad. It's the only time I'll ever see a superhero movie is in the theater. So I, I wouldn't be watching this at home. The, the experience is way different. But if this is illegal in any way or they're, you know, crossing contract lines, I, I don't like that. And I feel bad for the actors and the directors and the writers who are banking on this income. So that's tough. And if, if HBO Max can somehow, 
rectify that. I, I think it's it's fine. But yeah, it did seem like like you were saying it's the, the end of an era was coming. It just seems like that era is here now. Yeah. Do you think that? Um, what do you think was the golden era of content being put out? Because I talked to Book Club Maddie about this a lot, and how there's a lot of sort of like mid budget movies. Uh, that weren't superhero movies that were you know able to be made in the 90s like a lot of like legal courtroom thrillers where it's like the budget was probably somewhere between like 30 to 50 million dollars and now there's no middle class it's either mm-hmm. a really high and expensive uh, superhero movie or it's an indie that probably goes straight to um, to streaming and now you we can't get, like, see a any cool series though on prime yeah but now i guess that's the thing that's the alternative is now there's just maybe better television being made and I, I know it's like such a, you know, yeah, like a Fleabag movie. would have been a movie in the 90s. Now Fleabag is an amazing series on Amazon Prime. So, so Shane, you're saying that you think that the year we're in stacks up to the 90s that we miss now. Oh, we're in the best era ever right now. If we're just talking about content, there's so much amazing stuff out there. Like some YouTube things I'm watching right now are, are just amazing. But it, that awesome movie like seeing a, a cool Indian theaters that that time is coming to a bit of an end. Yeah. I think maybe what people are missing, like, like, you know, like there's this like late nineties, early two thousands, like Miramax Renaissance when something like, like Shakespeare in love was made, or you'd find some weird movie like Roger Dodger. You'd hear about it from a friend or SLC punk or something. And it's like, I don't know if we're so much like, Oh, I miss when movies were like that or that they got made. Cause like Shane said, we're in like the content era. You can find something for everyone and it's quality. There's good stuff everywhere, really good stuff everywhere. Maybe we just miss life that way, a simpler life. Like maybe what maybe we're conflating the two. We don't necessarily like going to a blockbuster was such an amazing fun time that it's it makes you like with this example, you're looking back at it with the same fondness. Yeah, it definitely feels um, like the technology that is available to creators just has uh, speeded everything up too. You're just able to make that much more. You know, even in you know in music, uh, there's a lot of amazing artists that you can discover right now that maybe you never would have heard of before because they can record from home and their songs are just great. Uh, but then you also have to kind of wade through a lot of stuff. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I think probably similar to television and, and all the streaming stuff, it's like there's great stuff there, but you kind of have to wade through a lot of shit. But then you also consume it a lot faster. Before, things were stretched out, right? It's like you watch a show, it's on once a week. And so the, the lifespan uh, as a viewer is much longer. Now you bit, you can binge a show in a week and you've watched all 15 episodes or whatever. So... Yeah, it is. Uh, it's hard to compare even the two because it's just the, the time moves so much faster uh, these days. When you go on Netflix, do you ever like what's your Netflix strategy to find a show? Do you ever just go through and check all the previews or is it just, oh, uh, this Queen's Gambit is popular right now. I'm going to watch that. I do. I do like so Queen's Gambit before it became like a uh, like a phenomenon what happens is Netflix gives you the, the preview, right? So something new comes up and you hover over it and then you can watch the trailer. If that trailer gets me like, hmm, I'll like set it aside. Weirdly, that the Aaron, new Aaron Sorkin, um, the trial of the Make. seven. Yeah. Oh, oh, the trial of the seven. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, like that's... all-star cast, all that stuff. So, again, trial comes, or sorry, the trailer comes up. I'd read about that film like last year. I was like super excited. I read a huge Q&A with Aaron Sorkin before the film came out. I was like, I can't wait. And then I just never actually found the time because I'm like, I got to set aside like time for a movie. I find with Netflix, I'm usually just watching like, it's like my, like I'm going to bed. I'm putting on an episode of Deep Space Nine that I can fall asleep to. I don't find it like appointment viewing. Someone has to say to me, Mike, you have to watch this movie. It's exceptional. And then I'll go to my way to watch it. But I find I don't even really watch movies on Netflix anymore. It's just like old shows I've already watched because I'm just, I only have a little bit of time. Like I'm trying to watch something to fall asleep or I have like half hour at lunch sort of deal. You know what I mean? So you haven't seen Mank, the new uh, David Fincher movie? I have not. Is it is it there? Is it worth it? Are you giving me a reco? It's good. It's it gets a little too into it, like it's mildly confusing. Yeah, but it's uh, it's good. It's really it is worth watching, and uh, Gary Oldman's amazing in it. Okay. Yeah, the one thing though, I think Mike, that you're getting at is that what made going to the movie theater so special, and it's still so special to me, is like the ceremonial part of it. It's just like, I know for the next three hours, uh, I don't, I can't do, I can't do anything. I'm going to get to the movie theater. I'm going to buy some popcorn, buy some candy, get a large Coke. 
I'm going to have to turn off my phone. Great point. And, and I, and, and that, and I love that. And, and, um, you make a choice and you can't do, it's like, I'm, this is what I'm doing. Like even, yeah, I would like, even after the baby would go to bed, like in the early days, I'd be like, Danica, I'm popping over there. Cause I really want to see X, this movie. And I would just go in and see it. And to your point, that's what you're doing for the next two hours. Yeah. It's, and it's hard to compartmentalize now. Yes. And I've, and I've been talking to manager Ash about this is like, by nine o'clock, we have to make a concerted effort. Okay, we have to stop. We have to turn our brains off. We have to stop because otherwise we could just keep responding to emails. We could just kind of keep working. And what made the going to the movies so therapeutic uh, for me uh, was was that it, it was just like, no, this is time for nothing else but this, which is you're, you're not divided in any way. Yeah, because it's like, a, it's almost illegal to turn your phone on. In a it, it is. Like yeah, it might as well which be. Which is great. And I feel mm-hmm. like you of all people, Max, you're probably a nightmare to watch a movie with or a series in the home. Yeah, I am. You're completely <laughs> right. But I'm actually pretty well behaved in the movie theater. No, you're right though. Like this mm-hmm. is the thing. It's just like, I need to... Um, yeah, I, I I need those like r- government rules. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's like if you're living in the state of uh, Cineplex, uh, and and they're the governing body, you gotta you gotta go go by their rules, and I, and I need that. So yeah, that that's the one thing I really miss about going to the movie theater is that there's all these things that would offer me an evening reprieve from work. Well, and it is, sometimes it's a sports game, sometimes it's going you know for dinner or whatever. But like the movies were like the most like relaxing state for me, and yeah, you're not not getting that any lately. So I I I only say this because as convenient as it is to have movies just streaming in 2021 that normally would have gone to the theaters, and that's sort of a necessary thing that needs to happen right now while we're at home. I hope it doesn't doom the movie theater institution, which I, which a lot of people are predicting, because I want as many movie options in theaters as possible. The second it's probably just going to pare down how many theaters there are. Yeah. I think, I think a great example of what you're explaining is this. I, I've been looking forward to Dune. That trailer came out. I'm super excited for Dune, the science fiction movie with Timothy Chalamet. I'm like into it. If that comes out in theaters and we're not in a pandemic, I 100% see that probably in the first week, 100%. Now when it hits Netflix or crave, when it hits crave, uh, I might go like, I might punt. I might keep punting on it because I just know it's there. I know it's there and I'll watch it at some point, which means I'll never end up watching it. And that's the difference. I probably won't end up seeing that movie just because shit will keep coming up. Whereas if it was in a theater, I 100% would have found two hours to go see it in that first week. Are you excited for Dune, Erica? You're Chalamet or? <laughs> yeah, I am. I've actually never heard of it. So um, yeah, I'm excited. I like anything he does usually. So That'll was he it. good on SNL or did you not check that I out? I haven't seen it. I didn't watch it and I haven't seen any of the clips actually. Did you guys see it? No, I have haven't. it on PVR. Mm. Manager really Ashes is so. underwhelming. And, mm. Really? And oh. she also has a hot take on Chalamet that she does, doesn't buy the hype. Which get, is, get her on the mic. Get her on the mic. Tell her to sum up her Chalamet. <laughs> I want to hear this hot take. Do, 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 okay, she's coming over here right now. Here we go. <laughs> um, Manager Ashes hot take. This could be a new segment. Okay, here we go. Manager Ash is going to... I have a follow-up question for Manager Ash. (laughs) Hello. Um, No, I just... I I actually, even before this SNL monologue, debated if he had an accent or not. (laughs) Like, I was like, are you more exotic than I thought you might be? (laughs) And so when he first came out, I was really excited that he sort of dressed like he wanted to be there. Because you could be like, you know, a little schleppier. And I was like, okay, we like got all polished. I get it, I get it. But he wasn't funny. And then he oh. pulled up to a piano for the exact same holiday Harry Styles bit, which is ah. impossible t- to compare to. And it was worthless. <laughs> so so ba- ba- basically, uh, Ash's point is that nothing compares to Harry Styles and Timothy Chalamet, get off the block. Uh, Harry Styles owns this block. And uh, that's that. There's no, there's I was going to have a theory that maybe she only liked like Brad Pitt buff guys and maybe not like Leonardo DiCaprio, more delicate mm. men. But no, I would no, say she, Harry Styles isn't. He's kind no, of in the she, same No, Ash is into delicate yeah. guys too. But okay. I think just Chalamet, you know, just doesn't. I, uh, I, did, I did read, I read like I think like a Hollywood Reporter quick blurb on it, but I heard there was a lot of Pete Davidson. And I guess him and Pete Davidson are pals, like, like in real life. Wow. So that got Pete into like five sketches. I think Pete sat down yeah. at the piano. Basically, this was like the Pete Davidson show because his buddy was hosting and was like, get me into sketches with my friend. That's, that's what, okay. That was the review I read. Haven't watched it yet though. Okay, so for our listeners, the season nine of Letterkenny is 
coming out on Crave on Christmas Day, December 25th. Of course, uh, you can see all the past episodes, the special episodes, uh, the original web series, Letter County Problems. They're all available to stream on Crave, along with our show, uh, Mike and Much in Conversation With, where we talk to Jared Kisa. So if you're a fan... Uh, We've got Letter Kenner for you. We got it on Crave. We got it on this podcast. Uh, and we got it in this episode specifically. So we sat down to talk uh, with Tyler Johnson and Evan Stern uh, about their roles on the show, uh, how the show has sort of changed o- over time, uh, the delicacy of comedy in 2020, um, how they even shot the show because we were a little bit like, did you shoot in a pandemic? You will get the answer to that uh, when we get there. So guys, Curious. without further ado, let's get to Tyler Johnson and Evan Stern. We're excited to have you guys on because we've had we've had Jared, we've had Nate, we've had K Trev. Uh, so I just feel like eventually we'll work through the whole cast. Uh, um, but one of the things I was interested about before we get into sort of the mechanics of season nine is at the very start. You know, we had like I said, uh, Jared and Nate on um, when the show was initially launching, and we talked a lot about sort of casting and the choices that were made and how that came together. I want to go back to the start and ask you guys your experience and how sort of you came to the project originally uh, and sort of how that all developed. So maybe we'll start with Evan, you know, that sort of the process of getting on the show. Sure. So I uh, started off like every other show. I auditioned for it um, over at Lewis K Casting and uh, I actually auditioned for the part of uh, Stuart uh, that uh, Tyler plays. And <laughs> the, I remember the breakdown being something like, looks like a meth head break dances or something like that like it was something really <laughs> concise and i was like oh i got this like this is exactly who i am as a person um, <laughs> all of it you've used that line before evan you've used that line before come on yeah <laughs> uh so i showed up and i like i you know i i i initially delivered it like very kind of close to um how the web series was originally done like very very tight and quick quips um and I guess something in there stuck and they they liked it, but they were like, oh, there's something there's something else here. It's it's you're definitely not Stuart. You're something else. So they came back to me with uh, the idea that they made a character called Rold, who would be a much more subservient. I don't know how they picked up on this a much more <laughs> subservient character uh, that break dances and all that sort of stuff. So it was like they, they just uh, came up with Rold after I'd auditioned for uh, Stuart. Tyler, how, what was your path there? And, and were you familiar with the sort of the web, uh, the Letterkenny problems that had already sort of caught fire? How I got involved with Letterkenny is uh, Jared Kiso, who's the writer and creator, of course. Um, he and I did a mini series maybe eight or nine years ago for CBC, which was the Don Cherry mini series. Of course, Jared uh, played Don Cherry. I played a younger version of Don Cherry, which was fun. I played him from about 15 to 20. And then Jared played him from about 20 to 65. <laughs> and, uh, That's range. We always laugh because, yeah. you know, Jared's like three, four years older than me, but uh, I was playing the 15 year old version of Don. And, and you still again. could. The, the, <laughs> the 60, uh, 60 year old. So, so Jared and I became friends doing that. And he lived in Vancouver at the time and we would hang out and he was always telling me about this, uh, this show that he was trying to get developed. And he was, um, making the, the YouTube videos at this time. And he says, when I get the show made, I'd love for you to be a part of it. And I remember being very excited about it, but uh, you know, at that point it was just a couple of videos on YouTube. And then uh, when he started getting into development, he's like, we are making it into a show. Uh, I'd love for you to get involved. And uh, I auditioned for it. And it, same thing as Evan said, I remember the, the character description. It says 30 something year old, long, black, dirty hair, you know, very, very like, uh, far away not you not yeah, Tyler the, the, <laughs> the anti Tyler yeah exactly but I had a lot of fun with the audition and then Jared called me and said hey buddy I'd love for you to come to Sudbury and we're gonna put a black wig on you and you're going to be the lead skid Stewart uh he called me himself of course because he's a freaking beauty and he wanted to tell me before my agent or anyone else told me and that was uh that was the beginning of Letter Kenny for me that's awesome was there Was there a moment along the way, maybe in the early days where you guys kind of like personally, like, was there a moment where you go, oh, this is becoming a phenomenon? Was there something that stands out to you where you go, oh, this is, this is actually becoming a thing, not that I just did and some people see, but that like people love and and are seeing in large numbers? I think we talked about this uh, earlier today and we agreed that kind of season three 
is when it sort of became really real for us, right? Like it, it just sort of kicked off, like it was like a rocket at season three, it just sort of changed. Um, but I also realized now that seeing people have tattoos of Letterkenny uh, kind oh of personally gosh. had an effect on me where I was like, what? That's yeah. how serious other people are taking this? <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. What do you think it was about season three that was a turning point? Well, for me personally, I remember going to Vancouver's airport at YVR there and uh, just the beginning of season three, I looked up and in the airport, there was this huge advertisement for Letterkenny. It was Crave TV and there was an ongoing commercial that was just kind of running back after back after back. And I remember looking up and being like, wow, like that is a significant advertisement uh, and thinking like, OK, there's there's something going on here. Um, so season three was definitely like a, a pivotal year, I think, for the show. Before that, we were just sort of like a, a brand new streaming service television show. You know, Crave TV was brand new and we, we did six episodes and then we got picked up for a second season. And then, uh, well, I was just saying those first like those first six episodes, you really never know how they're going to turn out. And people really like them. But it's also kind of like, was this just like a like a, a like a lucky kind of six episodes? And then season two people kind of, it's a bit more like, oh, okay. So it's like, there's a little bit of, you know, it continues. Like, it's not just those first six ideas. And then season three, it's like, it's blown open at that point. I think the order for season three was something like, you know, 30, 50 episodes into the future. So we were like. <laughs> you know, it's funny that you say that because obviously, you know, when it comes to music or television, you know, you want to have be like a big hit buzz thing about right out of the gate. You know, you want to be that band that's like on their first album you know, everybody loves and everybody's hearing about. But more often than not, the stuff that really has legs and longevity is the stuff that has been out for, oh, do you know there's three or four seasons of this show? Or, oh, this band is actually on their fifth record. It's like, and I think about bands like The National, who are one of my favorite bands and one of the most successful kind of indie rock bands of all time. And they didn't really find a larger, wider audience until their fourth album, right? And now the dude is producing, Aaron is producing Taylor Swift's album. But it, it took, you know, de 10, 20 years to sort of get to the point where people are like, oh, Aaron Desner of the Nationals now work with Taylor Swift. But it was not like that in the early days. So it feels there's there's uh, some similarities there, at least with the first couple seasons of, of Letter. Absolutely. And with that, there's like a slow build with the kind of ego that's involved in sort of success mm -hmm. as well. If you, if you don't achieve massive success right away, you can kind of like find your sound or find your style over time gently and really kind of concretely and not let like all the things about uh, other people liking it affect you and change you and change mm -hmm. what you deliver. So I think that's really well put. And there's a lot of shows where like, they unfortunately don't get a chance to find their legs, you know? And I'm, I'm yeah. someone who views shows like this too. Like I'll watch an episode, maybe two episodes and my mind's made up already. <laughs> so the idea yeah. of like being able to go back and reference old episodes and, and like maybe kind of uh, rediscover a show is, is always very exciting. Totally. Like you There's said, almost Max, like a, yeah. No, go on. Well, with, with, well, like Max said with music too. Like you know, sometimes a, it, it's it doesn't do a band any uh, favors when they they have one single and they blow up or whatever. Because as a music consumer, I love finding a band and then going back and re-listening to some of their older albums and some of their sure. older singles and things. Because if you if you just show up and you get a one hit wonder, all of a sudden all the fans are just sitting there waiting. So what's next? What's the next episode? What's the next single? And all this pressure mm -hmm. is mounted on your shoulders. Where in this case, like Evan says, the show had an opportunity to sort of organically grow and and find its own voice without too much outside uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know perspective. Because now you know we've got like some very cool A list celebrities who are fans of the show. And <laughs> I think if that happened in the first few episodes, we'd be like, holy smokes, like, <laughs> you yeah, know, sure. like Ed Norton's watching this. So let's make sure we're, you know, like doing the best we can do and put, put maybe unneeded, uh, unnecessary pressure on ourselves. It's funny. You mentioned Max, you were saying, you were wondering like, you know, when, when Brad Pitt becomes a fan of the show and that becomes sort of national news, Max, you were wondering what like the group chat would be like amongst the cast. Yeah, who's in the group chat? I want to know the mechanics of this. Like, how many people are in the group chat? Are there side group chats? And what was the conversation like? Was there a screen grab of it? Like, I, give me your honest reaction. And and, and who, who was freaking out the most? It was like the moment it happened. Like, I feel like it, like every, I, at least half I think of you us had were it first, watching. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, think, I think it was just like, I was, I don't know if I was recording the screen at the time or something. And it was just like, I, I think, uh, someone who I'm surprised was as excited as he was, Kiso. 
loves yes. Brad Pitt. He so loves Brad Pitt. And I did not know that until, <laughs> yeah. but of course he does Brad Pitt bit. Like these jokes all in the show peppered in there about Brad Pitt, but like, yep. oh, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle was excited. I'll say that much. Yeah, it's funny because um, you guys have reached sort of a, a point of popularity where you guys are referenced so much within your fan community that there's no need to share stuff. Probably, it, you know, we were talking to um, this uh, artist Benny who has who's like the number one TikTok song of the year, and and I'm and at, at a certain point you kind of stop sharing stuff because you're like, okay, another fan did a thing, uh, and not cool. another drawing of me. Oh. And, uh, no, right? <laughs> no, not us, so Max. Did- we. Sh- we share every article. We share every comment. Every time yeah. a person likes my photo, I'm you sending say a screenshot to You say anything nice about Tyler, like yeah. he's there for it. Uh-huh. No, no, no. But I want to know that there is a threshold though, because it is, it is like the Ed Norton. It is the Brad Pitt. It's, it's, so it's like, is there anyone who's reached the threshold of late that you're like, oh, did you know that so-and-so is kind of into the show? Or has that, has that come up lately? That's a good question. Um, we're still pretty excitable. Uh, I will yes. say like our, our yeah. little group is, is really like our, our group chat is goofy and very uh, kind spirited. And I think we're all pretty uh, like, I don't, I wouldn't say we're all small town people, but we're, we're definitely all uh, eager starry eyed people in a lot of respects. Mm. So I think we're still pretty jazzed. Every time something comes out of a new piece of information, like, uh, you know, somebody gets a new dog, even we're all <laughs> so excited mm-hmm. for them, especially so now, wanna, too. We, yeah. we miss each other more than ever now, too, obviously, with everything happening. So it's like, uh, it kind of refreshes Dude, our perspective on everything, you know. It's this like, press uh, day is a joy to see Tyler all day, <laughs> has been like a delight for me. I have been very happy about that. Well, it's been pretty good for me. That's a pretty natural segue sort of toward the way that things are now. And one of the things we were wondering is sort of how the mechanics for season nine worked. Was this all shot pre-COVID? Was some of it shot and then you had to go back? Like, how did this work to get this this season out sort of during a pandemic? Yeah, it was all shot. Oh, it was done. It was in the can. Way back, like November, Ooh. August to November of 2019, I want to say. Because we were planning on doing the tour uh, oh. this like, you know, March, 2020. So we weren't you guys out on, weren't you guys out on the road when the, like the world shut down? We were in Detroit, I believe was the day Buffalo. that, uh, we were Buffalo when we, when we decided to go home. Yeah. Was that, what was that conversation like? Was it like, cause like, obviously these tours are so exciting. You guys are selling out these massive rooms. And then all of a sudden it's like, after getting geared up to go on the road, you kind of have that. Did you feel it coming? And were you like, ah, maybe we can get another week out of it. Or were you guys like, shit, this thing's going to be, this is done. I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe it was happening. I honestly, I remember talking about this with Tyler numerous times. We would sit at dinner with uh, Mark forward and Mark forward being the realist that he was, he's like, Oh, it's getting shut down like weeks in advance. Like I didn't even know, but he just kind of knew and he's been on tour a lot in his life as a, as a comedian. So I think he's aware of kind of what can happen and how fragile tours actually are. Like they're not these like certain things as people believe they are. They're, they're like, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, balls in the air when you're on tour. Anything can go wrong. It's crazy. Yeah, I was living in denial too, because um, I, I was like, <laughs> our COVID episode, Max, when it first started percolating, and we're like, oh, do you think like a celebrity will get it? Max, like, celebrity's not going to get it. Celebrities never get these things, and, and it was, <laughs> and, he, and then <laughs> Tom Hanks gets it. And you're like, <laughs> but you were you were so rosy about it, Max, because I think you optimistically just wanted to keep playing your shows. It was the summer's of coming. Course. You had a huge, you know. I yeah, I was like, it'll be fine. Like I'm always the it'll be fine guy. And uh, we were playing a, a charity fundraiser for Nick Nurse, the coach of the Raptors, the night the world fell apart. And the, the, it was documented on the Raptors documentary show, uh, Open Gym. And it was just on the air yesterday. So I was just watching it for the first time. And so they had cameras rolling at this event while the word got out that Tom Hanks got it, Rita Wilson got it. The, the team that the Raptors had played two nights earlier, the Utah Jazz, uh, Rudy Gobert, the center on that team, was patient zero in the NBA. And so I had just taken a photo with Marcus Saul, who had been guarding Rudy Gobert two nights earlier. So we're all looking around the room going like, what the fuck is happening? And then the players had to be kind of escorted out during the middle of our set. Like the room got very strange. Mike was there. Yeah, it and- was bizarre. But, but but I was still living like, oh, they'll figure it out in a couple of weeks. We'll, we'll be back on the road. Still, you were still optimistic at that point. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. You're the last one left. Uh, we had done a show in Detroit, which was 
um, I said this earlier, but one of the top three highlights of my life. Uh, there was 4,300 people there. The energy wow. was incredible. It was so loud. They were laughing at every joke. Every joke landed. We, uh, we got on the bus, had a couple of drinks as we drove to Buffalo, had a day off in Buffalo, and then uh, we're gearing up to do the show that night. And I remember getting a phone call and saying, hey, we're not going to the venue. We're hopping on the bus. We're driving back to Toronto. So it and that bus quickly. ride home was weird. I was, it was, I mean, people were still, it was like continuing the drinking from the night before because it was uh -huh. like, what are we going to, what is happening? Like, what are we, mm -hmm. we got to the border. I remember the border security was like, it well, was just, it was funny too, because you had like seven or eight of us, uh, nine of us castmates from Letter Kenny, and we were coming across the border back into, um, oh man, what's that uh, border town there in Ontario? Lewiston or Fort Erie? It would be Fort Erie or Lewiston, one or the other. Sarnia? Uh, Windsor? It was like a smaller uh, border crossing, and uh, of course we have to get off the bus, and we've had a couple beers, you know, because we were celebrating or doing the opposite of celebrating i don't know exactly morning <laughs> it's like a wake yeah, yeah that's the vibe yeah and then we uh we go into this like sort, sort of smaller border crossing and there's like six or seven border agents and then the whole cast of letter kenny kind of rolls in and you can see them kind of looking at us like very like curious as to what was going on and finally someone spoke up and was like yeah you know we're the cast of letter kenny the tour has been canceled and it was a very friendly uh, experience, but I imagine quite weird for some of those border agents as well. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. dis disheveled what? cast. Yeah, falling we're out like, of what the hell is yeah. going on here? We're like, we don't know uh, either, guys. We're trying to go home. <laughs> hey, Tyler, what, what are the, you, you said this top three moment in your life. What, do you know the other top, the other two? Good question, Maxie. One was uh, ATV safari-ing in, uh, in South Africa. That was a pretty oh, freaking cool. special moment. I, uh, I did a uh, safari with this German guy that I met and it was like in the back of some freaking metal truck and you're clunking around <laughs> and whatever. And he's like, he's like, I'm gonna do an... <laughs> he was a really nice kid actually. He's like, I'm going to do the ATV one after if you're interested. And I'm like, Hey, that doesn't sound no. like a German guy. No, I want to hear the accent. I'm not doing that. <laughs> Give me a break. And uh, he convinced me to do it. And we got on these ATVs. We were ripping around South Africa. There was, you know, giraffes and zebras and all these amazing animals. It was just me and him and a guide. We were ripping around for like an hour and a half. And I couldn't, I couldn't take the smile off my face. It was like this just amazing, amazing experience. So that's in the top three. Oh, and maybe in the top three as well might be uh, 2010 when uh, Canada won. Uh, the hockey uh, gold medal Olympics here in Vancouver. <laughs> He's such a good boy. Such like, a good boy. Such a good like, boy. <laughs> it was incredible. It was like 1130 noon here and Canada won and everyone's walking down the streets with their hands in the air, high five in each other. And it was, uh, that was a pretty special moment too. I feel like we're really getting to know you here with these top three moments. Yeah, that was lovely for me too. I feel like I got to know Tyler more. Oh, and I know I Tyler like pretty well, you guys. <laughs> You know, one thing about the show, and, and we talked a bit about this with Jared as well, but like comedy is in an interesting place sort of right now and has been for the last few years. And Letterkenny's always sort of been a really smart show about how it touches on like sort of class and gender and culture and race. Uh, have there been conversations about how to be funny while talking about these things in 2020, like uh, amongst the cast? Or is that sort of more of a writer's conversation? And, you know, where are you guys at with that? I think sometimes I definitely have had conversations with a few of the cast members about sort of stuff like that. And there's even been moments on set where we've had really great conversations where something is written into the script um, and then we discuss why it's there and then we break down whether or not it needs to be there or whether or not it's there for the right reasons. Like I've de I definitely have had moments um, and, and, and Tierney specifically uh, is who I'm thinking of in this moment. I had a great conversation with him where we broke down a line and he was like, yeah, you don't like, you shouldn't say that. You haven't been doing the work to say that. Like, let's, Let's move on to a different uh, a different line. Switch the line around. Come up with something in the moment that's a bit that feels right. That feels like as authentic as possible. Because I feel like when you're representing a group, especially if it's a group you're not part of, etc. Like there's there's all sorts of um, well, there's there's like responsibilities that you have in order to uh, represent correctly and represent respectfully. Um, and just asking and talking and discussing is a huge part of discovering where those boundaries are and where the lines are and where it goes from being respectful to like honoring to like, you know, there's all, there's all these different mm -hmm. levels and it's not just like punching down and laughing at people's like, uh, like, because yeah, Misfortunes. I don't know, there's, 
yeah, exactly. So there's a lot to, uh, to talk about, but we're lucky enough that Kiso and Tierney have pretty good heads on their shoulders when it comes to um, coming in with these like incredibly thoughtful uh, forward thinking scripts. And, uh, and they all come from a place of like, you know, love and, and to not get too mushy about it, but they're really like good guys. Those two, they really yeah. are. So Tyler, what about you? How, how, how do you conceive of this? It, I, I, I was thinking about this because, um, so in not to make this about myself because this is an interview about you guys, but the um, he goes he he goes for twenty four minutes and we just we all sit here listening. And, <laughs> not to make it about myself, but Max believes. <laughs> well, so we put out this Christmas song um, called Pub Crawl, and the song is just about getting together with your friends over the holidays. Mike has participated uh, in this age old tradition for the last like ten years, and we go on like a twelve pubs of Christmas. And it has some like goofy religious imagery in the song. Like, so I'm saying, Heavenly Father, please forgive us. Bless us these that. Anyway, it's very, very stupid. Most people know it's tongue in cheek. But there's a couple comments in YouTube that goes, I don't appreciate you taking the piss out of something that I take seriously. You know, that uh, I'm... I'm a religious person, and the fact that you that you're dancing around with the Virgin Mary in the music video, I don't find that funny, and I can respect that. Um, but so has there been anybody that that would sort of identify with the skids or the community that you are sort of portraying that goes ah, that kind of that part made me feel kind of shitty, or do they mostly go, oh, I love the fact that I can see myself on television? Like, has there been a spectrum of that kind of feedback? Uh, would you say? I have definitely sensed people who um, gravitate towards the skids who maybe don't feel necessarily part of one group or another. Uh, they, they all sort of seem to gravitate towards us. Uh, there are people who are self-proclaimed goths who tweet to me and, and uh, post at me on Instagram. Uh, and to be honest, I don't think we've really offended too many people Usually it's guys quizzing me about my um, heavy metal, hard rock uh, references. <laughs> In which like, case, you know, we can refer them to our good buddy, exactly. Patty. Yeah. <laughs> Why would They're like, Who, who's your favorite death metal band? Yeah. I'm like, The Roots? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> the Roots. Yeah. It's true. Um, we do have like, it's a, it's a really like uh, a good place uh, to... Just join our group if you're not part of any of the other groups. If you're not mm. obviously a hick and you're not obviously yeah. a hockey player, you're like, well, I guess yeah. I'm a skid. Like, I like music. Yes. I kind of like yeah. drugs sometimes. Yeah. Like, it's sort of a catch-all for, like, misfits, yeah. I guess. We always yeah. joke, the basement door is always open. <laughs> <laughs> and also closed. Yeah. I was thinking about this year, and for people in, in the entertainment business, it's a strange year, right? Like, so, you know, you don't get to tour, you don't get to be on as many, you know, shoots as you'd want to be. Uh, I noticed Nate did, like, a cooking show for Air Miles. That was, like, I got that ad. How, what, what's been, like, the weirdest thing you've done this year, like, on a Zoom call? Have you have any corporate gigs come your way where you're doing a private Zoom chat with, you know, some accounting firm or something like that? Anything odd? Any auditions that are odd on Zoom that, that, that you've been through? Oh, my gosh. I mean, I haven't done any corporate uh, Zooming or anything like that, but I am fully open to it. <laughs> it's available. <laughs> My management's email is Dr. J.B. Johnson. Yeah, exactly. Um, I've been doing a couple, like, I've been doing lots of auditioning and some Zoom callbacks and meetings and things like that, and it's fine. It's just hard to get the rhythm of the scene. And, like, if you're in a meeting and you're trying to, like, show your – personality you got to make sure that you don't overlap each other's jokes and comments so it's like it's an interesting dynamic uh you know learning uh, to to try and get a job in this digital age totally i actually had a i had an audition uh, like a callback with i was telling you about this before i had like eight people in the room so there's like eight boxes up there while i'm auditioning what? and i couldn't get i could i couldn't get the uh uh like my face to go away so i was auditioning against my own face <laughs> As the other oh, actor wow. and it was a nightmare <laughs> and then so as soon as that scene ended i took off my shirt i went to the other room i'm done i'm like i'm like i'm like declothed my agent <laughs> calls me he's like they forgot to do the second scene can you come back on right away i'm like not naked but near naked crying shirtless <laughs> i'm just yeah. like ah, I'm like throwing my shirt back on i'm like hey guys 
Uh, yeah, thanks for having me back. This is so great. Like looking at like eight different boxes, total, uh, like. total natural decompression. Yeah. It's so ridiculous. You should have done it shirtless, man. And they would have been like, "That's such an interesting actor choice." They would have remembered me despite yeah. their best uh, efforts. He's an artist. He makes bold choices. Yeah, I am that. Um. All right, guys. I've seen that? Uh, that in the actor that interview who's gone uh, viral recently, where the director yeah. made a comment about his wow, holy smokes. I haven't yeah. had anything even close to that, but geez Louise, eh? Yeah. <laughs> that was a brutal moment for that guy. Yeah, he was very good. Very good. All right, guys. Uh, this is going to be our last question. Uh, when we had uh, Jared on the Crave show, um, he said he would do 33 seasons if he could. Are you guys down for another 33 if it happens? Did Jared say that? Jared said. He's, that's what he said. He said he'd love to do 33 and that there was going to be a movie. How do you feel yeah, about can that? Can you send me that clip? I'm going to hold it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We Tyler have so much fun doing rate. this, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would do it for as long as we're having fun, and I can't imagine we're going to stop having fun anytime soon. I could see Rolled with a Walker. <laughs> You're right. You're right. I don't have, there's no world where I don't see Rolled with a Walker. Yeah, exactly. We, we aren't really, uh, we don't, they don't really age us. We don't have parents. So maybe yeah. we'll just keep doing it until, uh, until Jared doesn't want to do it, do it no anymore. More. Yeah. yeah. Well. Do you guys have, oh shit, I meant to ask this earlier, Mike, apologies, uh, because that was a good way to wrap it up. But um, y what are the accommodations like in Sudbury now versus the first season? Well, I mean, it started off in a way where we were kind of like, where the hell are we? Like we ended up in this hotel where there's just like rocks all around and no access to any food or water, it seemed like. Like that was the first <laughs> season was like, you know, bed bugs and rocks. And, and then now, <laughs> and then now we we actually found a way where we all get to kind of like stay together in this um, kind of Airbnb apartment complex. So we each have our own room, our own showers, our own beds. Uh, <laughs> just lux, just top top to your lux right there. We played in Sudbury a couple summers ago, and Jared insisted that we pop by his place to like drink some beers in the afternoon. He wasn't there. But then I guess the the mayor of Sudbury uh, owns the, his spot. So his the mayor spot is his, beautiful. His, very, he's right on the water. And but then the mayor came by, I think, very strategically uh, to mow the lawn, mostly so he could say hi to to us <laughs> that because he knew we'd be hanging out over there. But I was like, I just like love the fact the mayor of Sudbury is renting a place to Jared and coming by. Mayor of Letterkenny, yeah, yeah, to the mayor of Letterkenny. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Yeah, it was great talking with you guys. Before Thanks so much. We'll see you guys in person sometime soon. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Hub crawl someday, boys. Yeah, hey. get you on it. Always welcome. <laughs> Good plug. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. guys. See ya. Right, thanks, right, so thanks so much. See you, see Mike. See you, Max. Bye. Bye. Welcome back. Uh, thank you so much, like I said, to Tyler Johnson and Evan Stern for giving us their time. And uh, be sure to check out Letter Kenny on Crave December 25th, season nine. It's time for Shane's dessert. Shaney, what do you got for us? Okay, I have a topic here. This topic was presented to me uh, kind of accidentally uh, the other day. I, I've been communicating with this person for, I guess, a few months now. And I'll ask the question after I. <laughs> That's such a funny so way to phrase person, it. It makes it seem like way more like yeah. nefarious or something, or like. Well, I don't know. Communicating this... with this person for a few. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who this person is. This person contacts me at random, sends me messages. I'll read the messages right now, and then I'll get to kind of the topic. Uh, so the mess recent message was, "Your feed has never been weaker, bro. Did your cock dissolve completely and take the little bit of you that was left with it?" I what? said, "My." So I said, my cock dissolved in the womb, according to mother. <laughs> he said, ha ha. So I'm like, okay, it's a troll, but we, we're playing a, a joke game. Uh, a couple weeks go by. Get another message. Randomly, Saturday night. So at this point, you must admit, you are your wife's little bitch and do only what she allows, right? You see it? Because, bro, your game has been weak as fuck lately. And then I say, is it weird that I'm flattered that my game was once considered good? <laughs> good response. <laughs> and, and he said, I reread the above message and nowhere did I imply or attempt to imply that you or your game was ever good. Wrong takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
They won't and then I that. said, and then I said, less than weak is good for my bitch ass. <laughs> then he really laid into me. He said, holy fuck, you are a sad state man. Do you wear diapers these days? How you convince your wife to go out with you? Uh, one is a mystery. How you convinced her to marry and uh, marry you and breed? That's another mystery. <laughs> fuck, that's a unsolved weird mystery, bud. Call in the guy with the voice and try to figure it out. Fuck, he won't. You're a disaster and she's a mega babe. Get a grip, pal. Learn how to BBQ. Learn how to do a lot of things. Get better. You suck. Because I mentioned on the pod here before that I don't barbecue. Wait a second. So when he, said, when, when he says call on the guy with the voice, is he referring to Robert Stack from Unsolved Mysteries? Oh, now I get it. That's funny. Okay, uh, so that's pretty funny. That is funny. Okay, see, this guy's kind of funny. Uh, so I said, I do not wear diapers. I BBQ'd the other night. And then in parenthesis, I said, first time. And I said, I met Alex on an incel message board. And then <laughs> the, <laughs> the next day he said, I feel bad, man. You deaf can take a good shredding. Ha ha. I'm just messing with you. So I don't know my relationship with this person. It's kind of a love hate. I don't know what it is, but I wanted to know for you guys, who's your biggest critic? How do you take criticism? And then I have another part two of this propose to you or ask you first thing i would say is i i marvel at your willingness to interact because i just i just i just wouldn't engage but i i think that there's something very there's something that came out of that engagement that is funny like in its weird way and i guess it only takes a couple minutes talking to a lot of people i think this is the person (laughs) i texted with the most over quarantine max has nick nurse you have this fucking guy yeah uh wow okay so who's our biggest critic erica who's your biggest critic you guys, it's probably myself. Sorry to get really dark, mm. but oh. yeah, I feel like... This is like a, a job interview answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, probably myself. I feel like most of the people in my life are very encouraging and uplifting. And sometimes that's not always the best case. Like sometimes you want people, you need people to be able to just tell it straight and tell it like it is. But most of my friendships and relationships and personal or I mean um, professional relationships are fairly straight actually Greg is pretty critical sometimes my brother Greg <laughs> but, Greg's everyone's biggest critic I think Greg I actually think your answer of yourself is a is a good and insightful one because in some ways and it's probably self-defense mechanism I've probably already thought of everything that or at least I think I've thought of everything that people could criticize me for. And then I already sort of internalize it and and sort of have it. Um, I would say that Danica is not even like she, after all this time, like she really sort of accepts the flaws, uh, but she will like absolutely call me out if I'm, you know, if I've dropped the ball in some way, but I don't think that's criticism. I think that's just like, yeah, I think that that's completely fair. So I don't, I don't know if I have a critic. I certainly don't have a roaster, like the guy that's been communicating with Shane. <laughs> but, but honestly, like I, I think my answer might be almost exactly Erica's. Maybe I'm my own biggest critic in many ways. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then my brother probably, <laughs> uh, not in a super like vocal way or anything, but I don't think he would hesitate to be like, you know, you're being ridiculous. You know what I mean? I, I don't think he would hesitate to sort of share his thoughts. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, you know, yeah, because um, because like Erica, uh, I've done a good job of surrounding myself with people that are very like encouraging, and um, I think people give me too much credit uh, for being like a nice guy or whatever. And when you know when you know yourself and your own flaws and your own like warped mind, like I'm like, no, you you deserve to be in the gutter. Like you are like a piece of trash, Max. Like that's, I've been saying that to myself a lot lately. <laughs> While uh, you're in leather and whipping so yourself. <laughs> yeah. The gutter. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I've been saying, kind of muttering that to myself recently. Oh, and Maxie. Ash, and, 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 no, no, no. This is not meant to elicit like sympathy, but Ash is like, can you stop that, please? Like this is really, you got to cut that out. Um, but actually, uh, so Greg would be um, a critic. Uh, Dan Hamilton though. I think Dan <laughs> is, is a real critic. So. He, he called me, uh, he texted me one in the morning uh, we were talking about something very trivial the other night, and he called me scum, <laughs> which is like a totally like overreach. Um, and then he and, and he's and called then me I that before re- too. Yeah, I, yeah. Dan, Dan can be very hard on people. Um, and then I'd also say um, 
book club Maddie is is a good one too. Uh, he is he's good at like pointing out some of um, maybe my blind spots. Um, and he he texted me this like long thing the other day, just sort of like uh, cautioning me uh, uh, to be sort of aware of my privilege and to be like, just so you know, like the world's not as rosy uh, as it as it is for you as it is for everybody else. So just like know that like when you're all like, hey, everybody's a good guy. What are you talking about? It's like, no, sometimes people just treat you night more nicely than other people get treated. So just know that, Max. And I thought that was actually a helpful piece of advice. Um, but uh, yeah, so that, that I'd say, yeah, Dan, Matt, and uh, Greg. Uh, do you about- think these people are your friends because they're critical of you? Or do you think they're critical of you because they're your friends? Uh, say that again. Are they like um, what I'm saying is you're on such a pedestal for so many people. Do you are they your friends because you're like, hey, these guys don't treat me like I'm some superstar. Yo, for sure. It's because they they know you. You know, that's the thing about your friends, right? It's like they know you for your warts and all and they can see right through your bullshit. And that's why you keep them around. You know, I think mm-hmm. that's, that's the best part about friendship. Yeah. Uh, so there was a part two to uh, mm-hmm. this this ending. And this is a serious question. And I want you to be honest. Is this person one of you guys? <laughs> the person you messaging mean? you? Yes. Oh. <laughs> could could you imagine? I could. And Alex thinks it definitely is one of you guys. Who You're not out he? of this either, Erica. <laughs> are you for real? <laughs> yeah. Who would it be though? That would be that know. would be insane. Like you know both of us very well. I well, Mike. You, there's been. Anytime there's any mysterious messenger people, everyone always thinks it's me. And I think we're very close <laughs> friends, but everyone thinks it's me. It's like, I know it's you, Shane. Well, no, no. Okay, but here's the thing. I know what, you're, what you mean about like champagne boys, uh, you know, playing pranks and stuff. I just don't think it's in it like Mike or I would do it. I, if we were to go through it, like Paul Moncrief, I could see him making like a joke about it. Or, <laughs> Naming names. Or, 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 or Psycho T. Like, or ju- no, maybe not Jug. Sean Dawson Sean- I could see. Sean, maybe What's it's his not quite name? his style. Yeah. Um, are you allowed to share Les. the username? Like there might be some weird messaging yeah, in the okay. username. Yeah, the username is Jack Pine, but the person has zero followers and zero posts. He follows 19 people or she. It's it's just <laughs> so... It, it's I not would, me. I can assure you that. Okay. No, no, no. Yeah, well, because I would, I would be surprised if it's even a champagne boy just because I feel like it's so like... Um, like it really feels like a listener or something that like g- got to know you in the early days of the pod or something, and mm-hmm. they think you've changed. Like there, it is a type of teasing that I recognize um, in some corners of Arkell's uh, world where they think they know you and they're like really, you know, that you they've definitely had a couple drinks and they they think of you as their friend. So it's like they're yeah. kind of roasting you like you're their good friend, right? Like well, the first night imagine- I met Erica, she was pulling that shit on me. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. yo, this isn't cool. I don't know who you are. <laughs> well, does so. this freak you out, Jane? Do you think this might like, what if this guy lives in Hamilton? Or like, what if you come face to face with him? Or what if he knows where you live? Like, does this... Freak you out a well, little bit Well, he does seem like he, he has a heart of gold because the next day he felt bad. And I think he was drunk on Saturday night. And then yeah. I think he legitimately woke up and had a laugh and just said, oh, he, like he legitimately said, I feel bad about this, which made me feel good. In a way, he's like my friend. It's like a love-hate relationship. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Yeah. See, what was supposed to happen here, Max, just to let you know, and uh, was I was supposed to <laughs> accuse you and say, is this you? And that was supposed to be the laughing out point here. But of course, Max is just staring off in a daze. Like just the, he's like, sorry, what? And then 10 seconds later, laughs out of sync with everyone else, thus making us like the episode go five minutes longer. If you had to um, guess, would you say it's somebody you know? Hmm. I... I think I think like you said it's a pod fan. And it your brother's name is Jack, isn't it, Erica? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It is.